Okay, now we get into really the sort of climactic purpose of all this data crunching. As you're going to see in the lower screen, it's the history that pertains to verse 20. So you can see the satire of the language in verse 20 versus the history of the Eastern Empire. This is so biting, I, I'm really in a state of shock. Um, and hopefully I won't cough too much. I have really bad allergies. I've had them all my life. And they're kicking up right now. Of course, that should be eight. Alright. We first start, well, the point of what I'm going to say, I should say first. This is this is preview of coming at distractions. Okay. Koryas, as you'll see, starts the earliest, because we're ignoring the E-Day things. I'll tell you why in a minute. Koryas starts first at verse 20 where we are now it the next time and the last time it occurs is in verse 35 so everything between verse 20 and verse 35 has this connotation of God's overseeing it because the word kurios is used as a bookend Bible has a lot of ways to, to bookend the text they didn't do what we do they didn't use paragraphs they didn't use chapter numbers they used keywords, and that's what we're looking at here. That's why I'm calling it an anaphora. And I'm going to explain what that, that particular keyword means in a minute with reference to the text, but just know that, see, this is the widest spread of time. Text and time. Alright? The synonym for it is huias. All right, and that is in between the kurios. That's real important, like nested Russian dolls. Between the two references to huias are in verses 26 through 32, or just 30, 26 and 32. So what you so the technique with these anaphora, which I learned six years ago from Paul, from parsing out Paul, took me a long time to figure it out, is that they use these keywords anaphorically in order to focus on a given portion of the time and all the time before it and all the time after it is due to what's in the center okay and that's Greek drama that is the central thing that um, Aristotle taught in his poetics that's why when it says the day of the Lord you, you know, we can dispute whether Aristotle invented it or somebody else. But when you see the phrase Day of the Lord in the Old Testament, and then you see Revelation, which is the revealing, that's really the Day of the Lord. All the Greek plays in ancient drama, too, and clearly, you know, Hebrew as well. It may be first, I don't know. They had this habit of, when they did their plays or their literature, they focused on one central event and then the story was about what led up to that event the idea being that it was sort of planned by the gods for this purpose for the event and then what comes out of the event is like the result so that when you get done with the play you're like oh this one thing that happened in the center is a reason why time was what it was prior to and the reason why time is what it is after and you can talk to any literature scholar you want about Greek drama and how it's organized and talk to them about Aristotle's poetics and Aristotle specifically said what I just told you and, I mean you can just google on Aristotle poetics and read it yourself it's a series of like little principles about if you're going to write a Greek play because you you could get a million dollars if you wrote a good one if you write a Greek play here are the rules you got to follow and then every year they would have something like an Olympics for plays and whoever wrote the best play won the award and got like the millions of dollars okay so it was a big commercial thing in the ancient world and it wasn't just Greece but Greece was you know most popular for it the Romans had their own version because you know in the ancient world 
if you were a writer and you did plays or music or whatever, you had to have somebody pay you for it. Okay? I mean, it, you had to have what was called a patron, and the patron was usually a king or a prince or a duke or some really rich person. And then they got their kudos for sponsoring you, and then you had to do the work of the play, and then they would put on the play, pay all the expenses to put it on, and everybody would pay admission. And sometimes, many times, especially in Greek Empire, it was free and compulsory. You had to go. This is how they manage the propaganda and the, the culture of their people. It was a really, really big deal. Okay, it's kind of like the way Hitler managed his rallies and stuff. Except that, you know, we'd like to think that the Greeks did it for a more noble purpose, but it really wasn't. Okay, that's what this is playing to. The people who are receiving this text are Greek. The text is in Greek. So it's going to talk to them in their own language and culture. And it's not that different from the way the Hebrew is constructed anyhow. Which starts back in 1400 BC when Moses first started writing Genesis. And there were a lot of Greeks around then too. In fact that was one of the reasons they had to go into the land was to get rid of the Greek marauders. The Greeks and the Arabs hooked up to, to each other and they were killing and murdering and raping everybody they could. They could. And so God basically sent Israel into the land in order to wipe out the criminals. So she would take over. That was the whole purpose for Israel to go into the land. I mean, a immediate purpose. You know, forgetting the prophetic purpose. So, you have to think about this. It's all nested around a center. And then the storyline is like what led up to the center and what comes out of the center like the center of history is Jesus Christ and everything that happened before he was born was structured and the Bible repeatedly says this for the sake of his own birth and life and then everything that happens as a result of his own birth and life okay is obviously the stuff of history alright that's what this is coming from that's why I worded these introduct links the way I did. I wanted you to see the centrality of it. So with the anaphora, what you always look for is you look for the center. What's the center point in history? In When Christ did Matthew 24, 25, or when Matthew packaged it, the center turned out to be the English Reformation. I've already done the videos on that. When... Mark is writing, he's not writing about Western Europe, he's writing about the East. So now what's the historical center for the East out of which all the past was like directed towards and all the future is going to come out of? Now what that ends up meaning is that it tells you the trends of history because these things are still happening. In other words, once you find the center, it's saying, hi, this is the play of history. And it, some version of that play, of that center, is happening right now. That's why this is relevant. Okay, so, Kurios, Lord, first and last. That shouldn't be too hard to understand. Getting the wit now? Huyas, in between. Yeah, Christ was always God. And in the center of history, he takes on humanity. So he's in between. He's God before, he's God after, and of course he's still human now too, but in between, he takes on, he becomes human. You see the wit? Okay, because it's teaching a Bible doctrine lesson. Everything in these numbers always do. This isn't some arcane code. This is just using numbers to tell the thing, to, to help you understand the text. Just like we have chapters, they use syllable counts. Alright? Now, since this is 20 to 35, and this is 26 to 32, then you go back to Blepo, and you look for what's in between the 20 and the 35. Well, between that is verse 21, 23, and 29. And they also, all three, happen to be inside, ha-ha, pregnancy, now, 
That means outermost, God. Innermost, the seeing. 21, 23, 29. Okay? And holding the seeing is Christ. Humanity. The Son. Son of God, Ancient of Days, the guy who's going to come down at the end of the play and save everybody. Okay, so now think about what that means. You got three nested anaphora. This is the outermost, the outermost Russian doll. This is the Russian doll inside the kurios. Ha ha, play on hypostatic union. And the Greeks in the East in particular would get that because they had a big argument with the Western Church over this very doctrine. Okay, what is the relationship of the godness of Christ to the humanity of Christ? All right, the really big deal. Lots of people got killed over it over the centuries, and they're still fighting about it today. All right, but innermost, inner, 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 innermost are verses 21, 23, and 29, and they all use blepo. Or maybe one of them uses e day. We'll find out. Okay. So that's the center of the play. The very innermost Russian doll is about seeing. Seeing. So here's the Lord, always was, always will be, beginning and ending of everything, the first and last. And inside, as it were, of himself is his humanity, subordinate to his godness. Okay? Now, what illuminates the sun? The word of God, Matthew 4.4. 4. You will always live on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So, that's verses 21, 23, and 29. Whoa. So that's the, sim that, that's the, the doctrinal organization of the material. It's not just high so-and-so ruled this year and another guy rules this year and this guy did this good thing and this guy did this bad thing. No, no, no. What lessons of doctrine are you to learn from the history? And bear in mind this is prophecy but once it's passed it's history so you learn from it before it happens and you can learn from it after it happens. That's the whole goal here. So we start now to look at our nested dolls, knowing that it's God on the outermost. Next doll inside is Huyas, the sun. And the innermost doll is seeing what illuminates. How did the sun get through the cross? Because of what he saw. And the Bible actually says that. It's Isaiah 53. Um, 11, the last clause in it says, Yire, he will see, is how you translate that. While he's on the cross, he sees. Yire, and then the next word in Isaiah 53, 11 is Yizba, and that means he will be satisfied. And then the rest of the verse explains why. But Tato Yatstik, by means of his truth, knowledge, illuminating him. He makes righteous. Padato means by means of his truth knowledge. Yatstik means he makes righteous. Tzadik Abdil Rabim, The righteous servant for the people. That's how Isaiah 53.11 finishes. Well, not quite. There's one more clause. Well, Awonatam and their twisting sins. Who is bull? He took out. Or he took on would be better. See, if Bibles were translated with the same syllable counts as in the Hebrew, and they have been attempted ever since the 1500s, once you see those translations, it's like, oh, this is more memorable. It's more meaningful. Yeah, hopefully in the next hundred years we'll start doing that. So we got Kurios on the outside, Huyas inside, next Russian doll, innermost, is the seeing. Okay? So God, Christ, sees. Now, that's good Greek, but it's not good English. It means God sees Christ. See? 
the, the seeing is in Christ. The Kurios also means the Father. And Father sees the truth knowledge in the Son, and that's how our sins got paid. In other words, when you're reading this as a Byzantine Greek, if you knew how to do your syllable count, you're going to get really depressed. So once you see that, oh, these are the nested dolls, that no matter how depressing this history is that I'm about to go through, God is seeing his son, which means everything really is going to turn out okay in this play. The play of history, the play of reality, the play of harvesting humans who want to believe in him. Because you can choose not to. Not a very good idea. But that's the play of history. That's what all history is for. God, the Son, sees. But what that means in Greek, in Greek order, is God the Father sees the Son, the object. And of course the Son is, you know, part of the Godhead. So the father is seeing the sun see. See, it's got endless play there. All right, all because of the word, the the way they ordered the words. If they didn't order the words this way, there's all that doctrine that I just told you that you couldn't see in these passages. I mean, you'd know the doctrine anyway, but you wouldn't see how it is here. Which makes a big difference because if you just read this in English, it's like blah 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 and then blah 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 and then blah 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 and then blah 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 and it's like why are these words in this order? Yeah, well we're gonna find out right now. Okay, so we find out. We start with verse twenty. We got verse twenty up here. Ding ding ding. Okay. And you've seen me go through this before. It's, it's, and if he hadn't, that, that, I mean, you know, it's really hard to translate this. But for, and but for cutting short the Lord, see, the, the subject is coming second. But for the Lord cutting short the days, no we'll just call this possibility surviving any flesh it's really hard to translate it in the right same order and have it make good English sense basically if the Lord didn't cut short those days nobody would survive what days see this is the really important thing we all know this is talking about the tribulation yes the tribulation is literal and true but how do you know what it's going to look like if you don't have some kind of frame or reference in advance? Because remember, these there are going to be people alive who are going to actually go through this. It would be really helpful for them to understand what it looked like in the past, lower, smaller, baby versions of it okay because you know if it's in the future then it'll be passed to them and they'll be able to look at that past while they go through it now that past starts 693 this is a new paragraph starting here talking about he's sort of like introducing it dramatically if if the Lord hadn't cut those days short there nobody would survive and then you know the stupid scholars get uh, not all of them are stupid some of them are stupid get involved with well then it's not really seven years it's a shortened seven years it doesn't say that it just means cut short like cut short to seven years okay it's not a few days less than seven years he's saying unless he cut short those days in other words if he let the war go on longer because it's going to end with a world war that he stops if he let it go on one more day then everybody would have been destroyed like you know maybe they're all going to fire their nukes okay but he knows foreknows what day he's going to actually come back and once he 
once the tribulation starts, you too will know because you're given a calendar of every single day. And you're supposed to count those days down. Just like Israel had to do for Messiah's birth in the Old Testament. So you're going to need to do that when you're in the actual tribulation in the New Testament. So you'll know the exact number of days. But if he let them be one more day beyond what they will be, which exact number you will know from the start. If he let it go on one more day, everybody would be dead. Now, the only way I can think of where that could occur is if we had everybody fire their nuclear weapons. Okay? So, this period, therefore, starts at 694, which is 724, and runs to 716, which is 746. Now, I'm not going to go through all of that right now. What I am going to go through is I want you to see who this is. Because that's the big story here. The word kurios, hopefully you know, means Lord. When Matthew uses it, or packaging the Lord's words, every single time this word occurs in Matthew 24 and 25, it means somebody who is a reformer. It means that during that period, two syllables or three, depending on how you pronounce it, Matthew used two syllables. They said kurias rather than kurias. All right. During that time, every single time, the word kurias occurs in the Matthew text. Three things are happening. There is a reformer who alone or with others is busy collecting Bible manuscripts in order to create a better translation or sometimes a first translation in a language nobody's ever had done yet. Every single time that text is used, it starts in Matthew 24, 42. There is one exception in that Matthew text, which is in Matthew 24, 50, where the reformer is Charles I, son of James I, and his idea of reforming for the sake of Bible purity is to take away the people's right to have their own Bibles and decide their own way of worship. And what he got for his pains was deposed. So he was a reformer, all right, but he got deposed. And that's at the end of Matthew 24. So when you get into Matthew 25, which is really the same chapter in the Greek, the satire has already started about rulers trying to take over whether or not you have the right to study your own Bible your way. You got that? That's the meaning of it. And since Mark is writing on a repackaging of Matthew, one ought to expect that his use of kurios is going to be consistent with the way that Matthew's packaging works. Yeah, from the satire. In other words, the rulers, isn't this? You can just check this in history, and here's some links to see these people. Okay, like Leo the First. This is Leo the First, Constantine the Fifth, Leo the Fifth. You read up on these people, and you'll find out that oh wow, Byzantine history is really quite different. In each case. The Byzantine Emperor was, as it were, the final arbiter of what should be the worship and the faith. Now, technically, they build themselves out as being working in concert with the patriarchs. They didn't have popes, single popes. They had, like, groups. Okay, but the guy who was the patriarch at Constantinople, the capital, was the most important among them. So, quasi-pope. But the quasi-pope did not want political power. Okay? Directly. He didn't want that. Whereas the Western popes really did want that. The emperor, therefore, was supposed to be working in concert with the religious patriarch of Constantinople 
and they would enforce their interpretation on the entire empire. Force it. The West didn't have that luck. People broke up early in the West. They, they were more loosey-goosey to start with. And the rulers did try half-heartedly, but it really, they, their heart wasn't in it. I mean, even from the very beginning, like Trajan, he just, he just didn't want to, you know, you go look at his letters with Pliny, and you'll see what I mean. But here, we're talking about defender of the faith. And, when necessary, what these guys would do, these emperors would do, if they didn't like who was the patriarch, and the patriarch didn't agree with them, they just replaced the patriarch and make somebody else patriarch. So it was much more a deal of the ruler, kind of like a Charles I in 640 um, AD. It was very much in the East from the get-go. The ruler sets the religion agenda. The ruler sets the religious rules. And that's what Constantine I actually did do. So they're much more akin to the way Constantine set government up. It's a unity between church and state so that he could have power over the priests, power over the prelates, power over the religion, so that they could never rebel against him. And that was a tradition that by the time we're looking here at 732 A.D., which is, you know, our word here, kurios, by the time we're looking at that, Leo III is in power. Now here's what's different. Why he, this is a watershed difference. Leo III kind of wanted, and he was, a lot of people agreed with him, they were kind of sick of. Oh, the Pope sets the rules, and they were particularly sick of, not the Pope, the Patriarch, they were particularly sick of the whole idea of Oh, well, you carry these statues around. You know, when it talks about the statue that's going to be erected in Jerusalem as an abomination in Revelation 13, well, this is why it's a statue. Because there are a whole bunch of people going to be alive then who they just, Oh, this is a statue of Mary. You've seen those Mexican parades where the Mexicans put some six-foot statue on a on a chair that has these long handles, four handles, and then the Mexicans support the, the handles with their shoulders, and they parade the six-foot-tall icon around the town in its chair as if it were alive. And that passes to them as holy. In their minds, what they're doing is holy. Yeah, well, that comes from Byzantine. Actually, it comes from other places. It was a pagan custom. It got passed into Christianity. And what people were doing, and they were going to get ready to do it even more after Leo, is they were saying, Oh, we made this painting of Jesus Christ. We made this painting, or this, this statue of Mary, the statue of some other, you know, hermit or something. And it got to the point where they were basically praying to or carrying around the statue. Now, that was an ancient Roman custom. You did that with your ancestors. You made little wooden statues. They called them lares, L-A-R-E-S. That's what the Saturnalia Festival was about. And you see it in the movie Gladiator where the guy's kissing one of them. You know, Russell Crowe is kissing one of them. Little tiny wooden statues. And you carried them everywhere you went. And then when you were camped for the night in your Roman legion, you, you lit a little candle and you took out your little dolls and you put them around the candle and then you prayed to them. That's what this led to. That's what was going on at the time of Leo. And he and a whole bunch of other people were saying, Nope. Nope. This is wrong. Okay? Just wrong. So that's the closest to like a back to the Bible movement, a kind of reformation, a kind of rejection of ecumenical religion that the East ever got into. 
And it, it didn't really start with Leo, but he was a big, big proponent of getting rid of that stuff. Okay? So, that's why, you know, this text is being started here. I mean, it's really pointed that it's Leo, because this word here, Xanadai, the birth of his son, who's going to be a lot like him even more, is marked right there. Right there, where I'm clicking my mouse. That's marking the birth of his son, with the play on words, because, you know, my son's an awful lot like an Ao, and so, like, the son is going to become something. The son is going to be born. Well, he's already born, so that's why he's using Genomai instead of Genao. He's two years old, and that's when he's going to become. This is the play on words now, because this is Genomai in Greek, and it means to become. He's going to become the next emperor. He's crowned right here at the beginning of this word at age two. And you can look that up yourself, because see, that's where I got it from. The link there. That's why I learned all this. See, crowned at age two. You can go look it up yourself. That's an in, These are all independent links. Okay? And I picked easy ones that, that are easy to read. They're short. You can read a lot more on other things, but this gives you the essential information. So here's Leo. Same website. And you read about him, and you read about Constantine. Okay, that's what kicks off the center. Remember? The center starts with Kurios on the outer layer. Think of concentric circles if you don't like Russian dolls. Outer layer, outer circle, verse 20 through 35. Next inner circle, verse 26 through 32. Innermost circle, light, seen, verses 21, 23, and 29. We've just sort of set up 20, and I'm sorry it took me so long. And when I come back, we'll get into the, the next occurrence because after Kurios, okay, the next occurrence is actually going to be about the scene. Alright? So I'll come back next.